Welcome to the SEG Latin America Regional Advisory Committee's webinar series, A Path to a Career in Geophysics. Dr. Sergio Chavez Perez, Chair of the SEG Latin America Regional Advisory Committee, and myself, Lori Whitesell, will serve as your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, the model for this webinar will be a short presentation followed by a question and answer session. During the question and answer session, if you'd like to ask questions, please raise your hand in the webinar interface and I will adjust your settings to allow you to ask your questions directly to the presenter. Our presenter today is uh, Mr. Jose Arce. He obtained his uh, bachelor's at the uh, University of Missouri Rolla in geology and geophysics and his master's in geophysical engineering from the University of Arizona. He started working at in Arce Geophysicos in Lima, Peru, Peru after graduating in 1993 and currently runs the company. Jose is also an active member of the Peruvian Geological Society, Mining Engineer Institute of Peru, the European Association of Geoscientists and Engineers, and the Society of Economic Geologists, as well as the Society of Exploration Geophysicists. So without further ado, please welcome our presenter, Jose Arce. Thank you all. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. And uh, thank you, Lori, uh, and uh, the Latin American Committee for inviting me to do this presentation. It basically, is, as you may imagine by the title, it's not going to be a technical presentation. It's basically just going to show, I'm trying, I'm just going to show what happened that brought me uh, into the geophysics field and what happened since I entered the geophysics field. So, uh, okay, so let's start. I was born in 1970 in Lima, Peru. And uh, in May 31st, 1970, there was a massive earthquake in Peru. So I don't know if that had any influence on my decision eventually, but maybe it did. I went to Catholic uh, school from 1975 to 1986. And just to understand, I'm going to tell you what my family background was like. I'm the last one of four in a family formed by a geologist, geophysicist dad, and a chemical pharmacist mother. Uh, the words I always heard during my childhood were Peruvian Geological Society, Society of Exploration Geophysicists, Seismic, IP, Magnetics, Well Login, Well Login, and all the other terms you may imagine. Uh, I was always uh, involved into listening to geological or geophysical terms and people, you know, so uh, it was very much into my family life. So, my father showed the four of us what geophysics was like, you know, during the 1970s, and occasionally some field work and processing. But in 1980, we received uh, at home the first Apple II computer, which my father, father brought from the US after one of the SEG shows. So this was an interesting uh, machine, let's put it that way, it was the first, uh, as many of you know, PC that became commercial. And uh, bringing it made a difference for me. You know, I, I saw it and there was, there were no courses, nothing. So, uh, but I had all the books in front of me. So I started reading them and read about, read about DOS and, uh, and uh, uh, a programming language, which was Apple basic at the time. So I got involved with it and learned programming by myself at that very early level of my life. I was about 10 years old then. So I read the manuals and self-taught myself on Apple DOS, Apple Basic, and eventually into boot code tracing. You know, once I finished the first two, uh, I was a very young kid that was interested in, in breaking the copy protections of some of the computer games. So I learned boot code tracing, uh, which was uh, basically based on this book, which is called Beneath Apple DOS, which was a machine language uh, uh, follow-up of sector by sector reading on a floppy disk. It was a very interesting and precarious uh, uh, test, but uh, you know, it was very neat and it, it gave, gave me, made me gain some skills, you know, and it was very useful. But by this time, you know, I'm talking 1981 or so, I wanted to study computer science. Okay, so what happened? 
things that happened around that time. In 1881, my father was, became elected president of the Peruvian Geological Society. In 1983, uh, my father gives me an HP programmable calcul calculator language program from the 70s to, to calculate 1D induced polarization soundings. This was written by Chuck Elliott, who is one of the big names in geophysics and in IP particularly in the 70s. So I transformed it into Apple II Basic, to e Basic by the time, and uh, adding some graphics routines to it. In 1984, I translated a Fortran code for resistivity 1D soundings into Apple II e Basic from the, I don't know if, if some of you remember the old COFET call, uh, code. So uh, I still have the book somewhere in here. So basically I had both routines, IP and resistivity uh, separate, you know, but I put them together into one single code. So they are adapted, adapted together with the same kind of graphical display and analysis by 1984. By now, I realize that this is not what I wanna do for life and uh, code programming, uh, I mean, you know, but I became very interested in the use of of my software, you know, so I requested my father to teach me more about geophysics and become and became increasingly interested in the field. 1986 was another turn. My father is elected to preside the Peruvian Geological Congress in Lima for 1987, and I suggested him. We did all the paper editing in, in a word processor, not work. Sorry, that's a typo. At the time, we were using a very precarious uh, word processor called Magic Window 2 in the Apple computer. We finished the work early 87. Finished high, high school in late 86. And then my university years came around. You know, I remember my university years very fondly, you know, and uh, when I went to college, uh, even though I thought that geophysics or geology were my fields uh, for the future, I always kept an open mind and my family really supported that. You know, they told me if you if you don't think you're gonna like it or if there's a moment in time that you uh, believe geophysics is not for you or geology, move out, you know, because the worst thing you can do is be a, have a profession that you don't enjoy working in for the rest of your life. And that was really a fantastic uh, advice I got from both my parents, so, in early 87, I was given the only option to go to the University of Missouri Rolla to study geophysics, to start in geophysics, not really study. It was, I, I had to decide that at some point. And I mean the only option because uh, I was, uh, uh, this was a school that was very tightly controlled and I, I was a, not a troublemaker, but I used to have a good time when I was a kid. So uh, this was a school I was gonna be studying for sure. Plus my brother was already there was studying electrical engineering. So uh, it was easier for my family to have both of us together. So in May 1987, I fly to Rolla, Missouri in the middle of nowhere in the show me state to start my degree in geology and geophysics, which I completed in May 1991, four years later. Halfway through my degree, a new professor arrives to Rolla to teach electrical methods in geophysics. And he later takes a, on a position at the U of Arizona during my senior year. This was the time that I was starting to already look for uh, options for my master's and, and a PhD later on. So he suggests me to apply to the University of Arizona for my master's. By then, I was presiding the, the University of Missouri Rolla student chapter of the ACG in 1990. A, this was my first involvement uh, with one of the professional societies. And uh, I guess I, I was always taught uh, that you should always give back to your profession, you know? So this was a very interesting learning experience. In Rolla, we had a, an inactive student chapter. We were very few students, you know, we were about, I would say 12 or so in all the, all the, the four years. And, uh, and we made it active and we started getting people involved from other, from other careers, you know, geological engineering and geology to participate, you know, and do joint lectures. So it was a very interesting uh, experience, uh, which I had for about a year there. I moved to Tucson in July 1991 and started my master's in August. 
very different change of town. And uh, Arizona is a lovely state. So. And then I met Ken Zong. You know, Ken, I guess during the one of our, uh, each of us has during their careers, uh, people that meet that really make a difference, professional difference, and also personal difference. You know, to me, I guess it's become obvious by now that uh, uh, my mentor was always my father, you know, but I was very, very, very lucky to meet and, and have people that I learned a lot from, like Ken Zong and Harry Siegel eventually, who was a friend of my dad, who was the virtual, I'm going to say virtual, because he was not the only one, but he was the virtual inventor of IP. So uh, I met Ken Zong through a very interesting anecdote that I have, because I was the new student at the University of Arizona, the department head, uh, Ben Sternberg, an old friend also, since I was a newbie, he sent me to pick up some equipment at Ken's office. So, uh, okay, so I take the, the university pickup truck and I go drive to Ken's office for Lowell. And when I arrive, I didn't know anybody, any of these guys, which of course I knew later down, down my, my, the following years, but uh, I entered and I asked for Ken Song and uh, there's this short man, well, about my height, I'm not very tall, and he looked at me and he's like, uh, yes, who's looking for him? And I'm like, well, I'm Jose Arce. I uh, come from the university to pick up some equipment. So he tells me, okay, uh, do you have a family member or somebody related to you that is uh, also a geophysicist? And I said, uh, yes. How do you know this? You know, so he's like, uh, I said, my father, you know, oh, step into my office. So I don't go to his office. And the office of this really brilliant man was very neat, you know, and very much according to the million ideas he had in simultaneous processing in his head, you know. So there were many papers, documents that he was all reading, reading them. And then I sat on the chair in front of his, of his desk and he turned around and uh, starts moving stuff on the floor behind his, his, uh, his chair and then picks up this very old, worn out cardboard box and puts it in front of me. And he says, please open it, you know? So I open it and I see some calcopyrite crystals. So I said, okay, and uh, what's going on, you know? So he's like, well, I'll tell you what, what happened here. You know, uh, in 1972, he was returning from the SEG in Mexico City. I think it was the last one that was done there, the EF. And uh, he was flying to Tucson. And uh, next to him on the airplane, uh, sat this uh, gentleman and they started talking, both of them geophysicists. And uh, he, Ken was telling him that he was uh, studying for his PhD electrical properties on different crystal phases. And he could not get uh, well-formed calcopyrite crystals in the US. So this gentleman said, I'll send you some from Peru. And that was my father. And, and uh, the box he sent, is, he showed me, was actually the same box that was sent to him. So that was the beginning of a friendship that lasted uh, between us really until he, we lost Ken. You know, we lost a, a really, really uh, intelligent and, and, and uh, very capable geophysicist. But I think more important, even more important than that, was that to me he was really a true gentleman. Uh, for the following years, uh, every time we went to SEG uh, meetings, I always went to see the mining talks with Ken and we were able to discuss them and eventually we became, we became partners in some operations. So in the U of A, I worked on three research projects, one for the Lawrence Livermore National Lab and two for the Department of Energy. This was very interesting because I was able to do some very different uh, type of research in this case. So I had a fantastic thesis committee, can't complain there. I had Carl Glass, Mary Poulton, which many of you know, I'm sure, and John Kemeny, who is the department head right now of, uh, of the Mining and Geological Engineering Department at the U of A. And, uh, well, Mary was just, uh, and both Mary and John were recently PhD graduates. So uh, uh, them, like us, we were all very young back then, and they, they provided wonderful ideas to, to, to my thesis. And Carl was the, my, my thesis advisor, and he was also a fantastic, good guy very good guy. By then, Visual Basic came out. 
1.0. So I bought a license and I, I learned it. I read the manuals and uh, I updated my father's sounding programs to a full, full Windows GUI environment. I graduated the summer of 1993 and immediately applied to two schools for my PhD, University of Toronto and Kansas University, and I got accepted in both. Why I selected? Well, with geophysics, it's very important to see who is doing research and where. You know, to me, at the time, uh, Gordon West was at the University of Toronto, and it was uh, important to go meet with him. And uh, I didn't know him personally, but had seen him at the SEG congresses uh, I, I attended before. And Kansas University was at the time uh, starting the early research and, uh, and paper publications of the MASW technique, which they uh, it became public about 10 years later. Uh, so it was a good time to get involved into an engineering geophysics method that I now use, you know, but so both universities were very good options. But my father calls me about the Southern Peru Copper Corporation job. There was a large survey to, that was going to take about six months on the Southern Peru property. So he suggested I go to Peru, I come to Peru and, and help him with this survey. And then I could return to my PhD with some more experience. Well, I never returned. You know, I started working and making some money and, uh, and that was the end of it. So I came to Peru in 1993 for survey number 383 and it lasted six months. Exploration had just reopened after many years in Peru and company companies started flowing in with a large increase of work requests as well as competition. By then, my father had been possibly the only uh, consultant that did uh, geophysical surveys in the region. He did most of, uh, of uh, the surveys on, on many of the projects in, in, uh, in Chile that you may know of, for instance, uh, the El Indio Mine and Pascual Lama, San Carron, Coipita, all those 1970s, early 1980s surveys were done by him. So uh, he worked regionally, also in Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, a little bit in Brazil, a little bit in Colombia, and some in Salvador. So eventually uh, I joined in this survey, one, uh, 383. So I enjoyed work and decided to stay for just a couple of years. Yes, yes, that's what they said. That's what I thought at the time. Now, at that time, the company was called Jose Arce Geophysicos, and it had two geophysicists both my father and me, and one field operator, one by nine, which my father had since the late 60s. By 1995, we hired a new guy to train as a second operator. We met this new person in one of the mining projects, uh, project operations uh, we did, uh, and he was actually a very, very capable person and did everything. He was from a mechanic to uh, uh, help the geologists pick up samples, did about everything. So we decided to bring him in and that was a fantastic decision. He's been with us since and right now he heads all my crews, He's the chief operator. In 1994, a new generation of magnetometers came to the market with full memory recordings. That was, uh, they were still not available before and that was called the Syntrax Envy. We immediately purchased two that year and six more over the following years. 1996, we changed to a latest generation seismograph, a geometric Strata VR24, and a new wall logger, a Monsoprix MPX2 unit. 1998, I got married, which was to me a very important moment of, of my life. You know, it was a very good decision, and, and uh, it's been a, a important for me, you know, ever since. From 1993 to 2003, I was only doing field work. Uh, we had one or at the most two field crews and I was in the field constantly, you know, so that was very important for it, for me to learn the business, you know, uh, you cannot start uh, and skip stages. You know, I'm a firm believer of that. And that's a problem that occurs nowadays with uh, younger generations of geophysicists and geologists who graduate and they want immediately to have a laptop with all sorts of software licenses, but really they are not interested in field experience. So you have to understand really the basics. And I, up to this day, 
you have to really, really understand it, even from basic cable repair to, uh, to just, I don't know, everything, you know, instrument operations. And so I spent 10 years of my life uh, pretty much the whole time in, my, in the field. You know, it's, at the time, uh, communication was scarce here. So uh, there were no sat phones. Uh, they started appearing at the later part of those years. But uh, definitely cell phone coverage was quite limited and road coverage too. So we did a lot of camps with tents and, uh, and it was a fantastic decade. Uh, I learned a lot there. So by the year 2000, the Kansas uh, University MASW method became available commercially and we immediately started offering it. I, uh, I, I read all the papers I had been reading over the years uh, through SCG and, and many of the other uh, publications they had. And uh, I immediately got into it. I had one of my uh, uh, Rolla College buddies who also did his uh, PhD uh, research there, Kansas University. So I immediately got in contact with them and, uh, and learned the method before offering it, of course. In 2000, uh, the company Jose Arce Geophysicals became a society between my father and I. In 2001, the IP in 3D inversions became, ava became available and we immediately updated our equipment and software. So it was very important right then. I got in contact with uh, the right people around that were working with this. It was still in early research, particularly the 3D inversions. Uh, none had been done in Peru. So uh, I started reading papers, got in contact with people, met people selected, tested several software until I decided the one I wanted to work with. And, uh, and this was a big change in 2001 for us. In 2001, we also entered an agreement with my friend and uh, dear friend, Ken Zong. During an SCG show, Ken told me uh, that he was very interested and very keen in, in working more in Peru. He had a Chile office. But if he was going to come uh, to work here, he didn't want to compete with us, but to be partners with us and uh, to offer whichever methods we didn't uh, have. And, uh, and, and they could do the same for us in Chile, you know? So this being Ken, of course, I immediately said yes, you know? And uh, I knew this was, a, like I mentioned before, a gentleman and I didn't need a, any kind of documents uh, signed with him. And uh, that agreement has been going on until today. You know, it was a word of mouth agreement. So in 2002, we did the first IP3D survey in South America in the Pierina mine, which led to the discovery and delineation of two open pits. You know, so uh, these are feeder pits, so they are small pits, but they are pits which had many interpretation errors, both geologically and geophysically prior to this survey. They were studied with uh, some CSAMT lines, which uh, showed uh, very, very deep, almost vertical uh, continuation of uh, high resistivity targets, which, you know, if you read Ken's uh, books and, and documents on, on, uh, on CSAMT, he always mentioned when verticality kicked in, and also in class, he said that usually a method had already lost uh, capability to measure change in resistivity. So that's why in CSAMT you usually see vertical structures. So uh, they erroneously interpreted these feeders as being very, very deep and vertical, 800 meters. They drilled them and they missed them. You know, So when we did the IP3D, we showed that these feeders were didn't go deeper than 50 or 60 meters. So they redirected their drillings and uh, they hit them. You know, So, uh, so that's how, uh, how the first IP3D survey we did it was actually very successful. By 2006, we had four more field operators. So we were starting to grow. And by now I had already participated in several boards of directors in the Peruvian Geological Society and some congresses. It is very important. And I, 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 I stated again, you always have to give back uh, to your profession. And that's what I was always trying to do during those days. Know, uh, and up to this day. So I got involved heavily with them. 2007, we started going to Colombia for Anglo Gold, the Shanti and Glencore, two of our clients, and uh, was the start of a relation uh, we have with Colombia that hasn't continued up to this day. 
2007, I get elected to preside the Latin American Geological Congress that was going to be held the following year. So through the years, what's happened to me and the company? In 2008, I take control of the company. And, uh, and uh, since then, I've been the one owning and running it. In 2010, we opened an office, uh, Sucursal means branch in Colombia, in Medellin City, which probably many of you know is a very beautiful city in a very nice country. And by three, 2010, we started, I started getting involved with 3D Mag and Gravity Inversions. There were the UBC inversions already, and a developer friend of mine developed an interesting code, and I started testing it. So it was very interesting. We started offering them since. In 2011, I get elected to preside the board of directors of the Peruvian Geological Society for the period of 2012 and 13. So during all these years, uh, uh, my involvement with all the societies was, was always constant, you know, and uh, maybe it's a mistake at some point. Uh, you get tired of it, you know, and uh, you get into many committees, but I'm always very keen and enthusiastic on seeing how else I can help, you know. Uh, trying to make a little difference somewhere. 2014 and 15, I was uh, elected for regional vice president for South America for the Society of Economic Geologists. 16 and 17, I was elected representative of District 6 of Latin America for the SEG Council. 2015, I was elected chair of the SEG Mining Committee. And for 18 and 19, currently, I've been elected chair for the SEG Near Surface Technical Section. And since 14 to 18, 18 I've been involved with the SEG MRPC Committee, which we evaluate the events and congresses that look for support for the SEG. It's a very interesting committee, it's very active, and uh, uh, basically we, we see what's going on, and sometimes most of the, of the of the requests pass, but we get different of our members to request even more information sometimes on various meetings. So you see what's going on in the world. It's very interesting. And uh, up to now, from 2007, I've been in the SEG Latin America Advisory Committee. So going back to professional life, now in 2018, we are on survey 1273. Actually, uh, there's already five more. I'm on survey 1278. And we operate 76, that's also a wrong figure, geophysical instruments. Uh, in 2018, I received my CG6 gravity meter. Wonderful unit. It's one of the nicest instruments I've ever had to deal with. And in magnetics, I, I, we have 11 magnetometers, both geometrics and gen for proton precision. We have the very, very latest updated overhauser sensor they have, which is omnidirectional, potassium vapor and cesium vapor. And here, having the four types of magnetometers leads us to learn also what the difference between them is. You know, uh, I'm always very keen on seeing the variations and proper application of geophysical methods depending on, on, uh, on the instruments and depending on local geology. We have 13 IP transmitter and eight receivers, one spectrometer, a distributed array IP resistivity system with 31 receivers and two current monitors, which uh, we were involved in the development with our partners from IRIS Instruments, and uh, we did all the software internally for this, and the QC. Uh, we have a, nice, a very nice time domain EM system, brand new, state of the art, and uh, soon we'll be receiving a squid sensor, and three size models. So, we have a very nice uh, uh, host of instruments and uh, we're constantly uh, working on with the, with the best quality instruments and also uh, seeing that they are properly upgraded. So these are the toys, you know, so uh, it's very nice when I look at this, you know, and you can see the gravity meters, the various magnetometers, even on the lower right hand side, there is a hydraulic uh, a seismic source that we're using in some cases also. So this is not all of them, but there's quite a few of them here. So uh, these are the toys. We get to play and use very, very, very nice toys. So what is a typical day for me now? 
mornings, data QC. And I should change this because it's mornings and very late nights also. So uh, either one uh, is data QC. I'm still doing data QC. It's the basics for all our work. I, I, I do get some help in it, but it goes from anything from very basic, simple magnetics QC and base station corrections to seismic peaks, to IP pseudo section and control of data to everything. You know, uh, I try to do everything on a daily basis. You know, it's important that, uh, that uh, all the surveys and work to me, it's important that it gets done uh, every day, you know, so I don't get work stacked up at the end of the survey. Plus, uh, sometimes I go back and revisit the data again, and I, I want to have time to do that properly. Afternoons, proposals, client meetings, geophysical modeling, reports, map preparation, and SEG call meetings, of course, and uh, any other type of society reunions that need to be attended. Night, family, less sleep every day, but that comes with age. Wine, food, and hobbies, you know, which are very important uh, part of a person's life to me. And uh, wine is a hobby for me. You know, I'm not a big drinker, but I do enjoy wine and I study wine. And uh, I have a group where I, it's two geologists and I, I, I'm also, I consider myself a geologist also. So the three of us have an enologist give us a class uh, every once in a while and uh, when we are the three of us are in the city and we don't expect to earn a, a official uh, a degree but we want to learn as much as we can you know so that's enjoyable and i should ask like i mentioned before sometimes late at night particularly when i'm traveling late at night is crucial to do data qc you know so my days are growing in, in, in work and being reduced in sleep <laughs> but i guess that's normal Weekend, I try to put emphasis again on family, sleep, wine, food, and hobbies. So, hobbies, I believe, are critical to be able to maintain a certain level of stability. For me, hobbies, like I said, are wine, espresso, travel, restaurants, and etc. You know, and uh, I love traveling. I try to do it as much as possible. And so is espresso. You know, we fight with the family, and that's something my father started. We we buy green beans and we roast them uh, within the family according to the need we have. But most important to me as a geophysicist is, first of all, the quality of geophysical field readings. That's where it all start, starts. Morning QC is crucial. And not only instruments are important here. Uh, I should have mentioned something more about the accessories. You know, if you use cables, you need to use always the best quality of cables, you know, to use uh, electrodes, you need to use the best quality possible, you know, that all adds up to a good quality reading. So uh, if we start there, we're on a good path. If we start cutting roads, uh, we will start uh, getting uh, lower quality readings and eventually results. We have to make sure that all projects run under very strict controls, proper training, we have ISO certifications and HX standards to an international level. So uh, it's very important right now, and that takes a lot of uh, uh, time and effort from our company to come constantly keep improving in our standards. We need to be delivering advances to clients when possible on a daily basis. It depends how, how, uh, how things start going on the field. Uh, we can't forget some marketing. I'm not really big into marketing. I really don't enjoy it, uh, but some needs to be done. I believe the best marketing is uh, word of mouth, but that sometimes is slower. Research and development for tailor-made applications. We have an entire suite of, uh, of uh, internal software and applications that it comes out, comes goes away from the standard off-the-shelf uh, stuff that you can order or buy. It's normal that uh, I, I believe it's very important you start uh, improving your processes with tailor-made uh, applications and software and instruments. Collaboration with instrument and software development, developing companies. We have a very tight uh, collaboration with, uh, with uh, instrument companies. Aside many of them being friends, uh, we do modification of instruments here, and we have the only authorized uh, service center, uh, center 
by many of the factories to maintain and, and properly test uh, their instruments locally. So uh, that's the only way we can assure to have instruments that are always measuring well, you know, and have low electronic error. Instruments, particularly digital instruments nowadays, they all will give you a result. So it's very critical that we know that result is, is proper, you know. So to me, uh, the very large investment we have in, in, uh, in uh, electronic support and uh, development also is crucial. Same goes with software developers. You know, uh, I learned a long time ago that I didn't want to do, like I mentioned, uh, programming for the rest of my life. And, and uh, well, now there's great developers around the world that you can uh, meet and have them develop particular uh, applications for you. And good espresso. Nothing as good as a morning espresso to get your day going, at least for me. Okay, so the software, well, there's all the nice things, you know, that you can see in front of you. Size, Pix, MASW, Daily QC, of course, Geosoft, I guess. Uh, nobody now, no geophysicist nowadays will run without a uh, Geosoft license. We have uh, several of the modules, of course, like many people do. And uh, it's the center, you know, and it's a, to me, it's possibly the best uh, map producing program uh, there is. Uh, but in, I, in QC and in uh, inversion and modeling, I prefer some of the other programs. I use also Geosoft, Geosoft so I'm not close to just using one. I prefer a lot of the things we develop internally. So, so. And the results, well, they are becoming more and more beautiful by the day. Uh, you know, you can see all these very nice inversion results. Uh, the top left is a airborne magnetic survey. Uh, it's an MVI inversion. Very clear, very nice. Shows you some geology there. On the top right, we have a, a distributed array IP survey conducted over 1,300, up to 1,300 meters depth in an extreme topography area. Uh, the bottom left is a, a, a small uh, mineralized breccia. The bottom center is a porphyry system that was measured in North, North America. And the bottom uh, right is also an IP survey conducted a few years ago already on a very large regional scale. So uh, the results are, are coming in nicer and nicer by the day, you know, and, uh, but uh, definitely I spend a lot of time, considerable time on R&D and always uh, improvement of our internal techniques. And uh, normally I'm, I'm looking already in the future what, what was gonna be coming up. So to me, a few last bullets to always remember that are important for a geophysicist. In order to make a proper recommendation on a usable geophysical technique, you need to understand that you need three conditions to be met in any project area, contrast, contrast, and contrast. If you don't get contrast of the physical property you're gonna be measuring, either because uh, you don't get the contrast itself or local conditions maybe, like topography uh, corrections will not be sufficient uh, for some methods, then uh, you should decide on alternative methods. To me, there is, there is no such thing as a good geophysicist who is not a good geologist first. And that was a learning lesson to me from my professor, Geza Kisbar Sanji at Rola in 1988. He said it, and, uh, and I believe up until this day, he's right. If not, we geophysicists are closer to a mathematician uh, and a physicist than actually a geologist. But you have to keep in mind always that geophysicists uh, run methods to study geology. Geophysical methods do not work in every case. You know, it's uh, they work in most cases, yes. You know, but there are cases that they don't. You know, and, uh, so you need to understand your local geology. You know, at the end of the day, whatever we're trying to do, whatever we're trying to interpret, goes back to the local geology. Understand your signal. Otherwise, we're just working with numbers. You know, why am I getting this signal? How am I getting this signal? How can I improve this signal and not, not destroy other parts of, the, of my signal? Signal is crucial. You know, if not, you know, you know, computers nowadays do very automated processes, but 
I'm not for that idea. I think we need to understand that study signal in every case. Computer software are just tools. Interpretation is done by people. You know, and that's the reality and that will be, I believe, forever. You know, there's no such thing as intelligent computers, not even a artificial intelligence, which is still quite basic. Anybody can produce nice color maps. And that's a reality. Not everybody can produce meaningful color maps. Non-uniqueness, you know, the same type, the same data set will not always give you the same result, you know. So there's many, one or up to infinite number of uh, field models that will fit your data set. So you need to try to make it as tight as possible, as perfect as possible, but you will never get away fully from non-uniqueness. And that needs to be understood and it needs to be explained to your clients. A cheap geophysical application will uh, in turn not provide proper information to save in drilling campaigns. So uh, you want to have a high quality geophysical application, you need to look at all the items I've mentioned before not off the shelf geophysics you know, and eventually that turns out into a cheaper campaign for your clients for drilling now as a professional you also need to remember you always need to give back to your profession we live off geophysics geosciences you have to give back to it it's quite important you have to learn from all the professionals i don't know how many uh, junior geoscientists we have here but do understand that they know more than you you know they do experience cannot be replaced and cannot be learned from books that comes with time and patience and older professionals have already lifted you know so they know give back not only to your professional at itself but to your professional societies there's many local professional societies and international societies the SEG it's a wonderful institution. You know, I've been going to every SEG, I believe, or most of them, I would say, since 1988. You know, and, uh, and there's also the, the, the other societies, the Economic Geology Societies, whatever you choose to get involved in, you have to give back and get involved with that. So uh, uh, it's very important to work with societies. Make sure that after you complete your working years, your profession is just a tiny, tiny little bit improved. Make a little dent. It's very hard to make a, a big improvement nowadays. Maybe people like uh, Ken Song or Harry Siegel, they, or Chuck Elliott, they all made changes in our professions, but we need to try to make it a little bit better. You know, So uh, I, that's what we need to point to. And honesty and integrity has to be an integral part of your life. If you don't work on an honest basis and with integrity throughout your professional life, you are in trouble. You know, it's, like, it's very important. To me, these are very basic values. I live with them. I, I was raised with them. And, uh, and you need to make them also part of your professional life. So. And that would be all. Thank you for listening to this. I hope I was not uh, boring. <laughs> Thank you, Jose, very much. It was a very interesting uh, story on how you got to be where you are today. Uh, and I appreciate your time. So with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, and if you'd like to ask questions, please uh, raise your hand. I see uh, there is a question in the chat box. Um, Sergio, would you like to ask that uh, live, or uh, are you good with the, the chat question? I'm going to allow you to talk. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, hi, Jose. Hi, Lori. Sergio, how are you? Uh, I, I was excited. I think it, it, I mean, it, it really sounds like a great and exciting life. Uh, and to me, the, the obvious question is, uh, I mean, what I wrote in my comment is that it sounds like you were meant to be a near surface uh, geoscientist. Uh, and in that sense, you could easily be a real role model for many people. 
uh, what I was asking earlier, you pretty much mentioned at the end, but uh, what is your main professional motivator? What keeps you going apart from some of the items that you listed? I enjoy what I do. You know, I get tired of it, of course, because we have uh, up to 13 crews right now. So I'm doing all that you see and all that. But when I sit down in front of data and I start to try to understand the signal, like I said, what am I doing here? You know, what am I learning? What am I studying? What am I seeing? Where have I seen this before? And uh, that's what I like. You know, I enjoy looking at geophysics because I'm trying to solve, to me, I'm trying to solve a puzzle of what those values, those numbers are representing. So uh, it's a very challenging profession. And it's a never-ending profession because no two surveys are the same and no two geological backgrounds are the same. So uh, same thing goes with wine, by the way. There's no two equal wines. So uh, it's not, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a profession that excites me because of that, you know. You, you never learn, you never finish learning, uh, but you have to keep up with it, you know. And you know, in this field, like in many fields, involvement is very important and uh, research is very important and you have to get into it you know and uh, to me you know so you can choose to do or to not to me it's important to be involved in all these stages to tell you a truth i don't particularly enjoy any kind of administrative work in our company there's people that take care of that because i really like to do what i do you know be a geophysicist Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there's another question, uh, and uh, they ask, "What is your favorite? What was your favorite field uh, uh, location uh, where you had to do surveys?" Oh, now that's an interesting question. Favorite may be favorite because it's a beautiful location, or it may be favorite because it got the most exciting uh, uh, information out of it. Well. There's been some really uh, exciting surveys. Uh, to me, the first survey I did after I returned from college, that six month survey that my father asked me to come to do, was a fantastic start and I was completely lucky about it. Because we did a, an IP survey northwest of the Guajone mine operation. And I can mention this because it's been published. And uh, that survey and that IP anomaly that we delineated Uh, confirmed about 1 billion tons of additional reserves for the mine, about 60 years of mine life. And uh, so I got started on a very great opportunity, you know, so that was very exciting to me, particularly as a young professional. But uh, to me, it was very exciting also when we were able to do this 3D IP survey in the mine I mentioned here, where we uh, measured the two feeders that became pits. 2002, that made a big change. But there is not one particular area uh, that I can say this is my favorite. You know, uh, I try to enjoy them all, you know, and uh, they all have their own challenges and uh, they all have their, their, their uh, good things and their bad things, you know. And, uh, so I try to enjoy them all, but there's not one particular one. But most of the surveys I do are enjoyable to me. Okay. Uh, thanks. I guess uh, the corollary to that would be, uh, what was your least favorite? <laughs> My least favorite survey. I almost uh, was uh, uh, frozen <laughs> in a survey in a hypothermia case where uh, this was many years ago. This was in the late 90s. We were in a project area that was really, really, really far away from everything. We went crossroads with vehicles for hours. And then we had to take horses for hours to reach this project. And uh, we were doing an IP max survey there. And why I hated it so much, the area wasn't bad, but uh, while the crew was, my crew was working and measuring, I started walking around and checking the area, you know, and looking at outcrops and, and checking it around. And walking and walking and walking, I didn't notice, and I ended up very far out, you know. And suddenly, a big uh, uh, storm came in with hail and it was very heavy hail. So when I saw it was over me, I immediately turned around and started walking back. But then the really strong winds and hail were starting to hit me. 
and I may have been maybe three or four kilometers away already from camp. So they noticed, luckily, that I wasn't there, and uh, my, my crew chief, and uh, he started walking with a couple of the crew people to, to meet me, you know, and tried to, they knew, they saw me the direction I was walking away. So they met me, and by the time they met me, I was, I was really kind of frozen, you know, I was getting, getting to be in a bad state. So that was maybe my least favorite survey, I guess. Okay, that was, that was, I, um, we're all glad that you were uh, all right, things turned out all right. <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, but these are the things you learn with experience too, you know. Uh, right. So. Um, we have another question, and uh, um, they're interested in um, what role, uh, I guess, slash courses uh, in programming and computing do you think uh, should uh, a graduate geophysicist have as part of their uh, studies? Well, thanks for the question, but I will try to answer it as best as possible. But really, I think I would not be the person to answer that because, like I said, I've moved away from, uh, from programming a really long time ago. You know, and now, uh, during the workload, I have programmers that do the work for me. Uh, but to try to answer a reasonable question, uh, reasonable, give you a reasonable answer, sorry. I would say C++ is a good method. I know uh, people are using now this um, uh, Visual Basic is still supported, but eventually it's gonna, it's gonna go. And uh, there's some new, new programming environments uh, that Microsoft is coming up with. I think there is no need to go to machine language like we did in the old days for many things. Um, Assembler is already is such a low-level language that uh, unless you're going to be doing software programming for instruments, uh, you don't need that, you know. But yes, if you are planning to do some programming for geophysical instruments, you will need to go into Assembler. Higher-level languages, I think, are, are, are the, way, the way to go, you know. And uh, Visual Basic, and there's a, now is there's a new called Visual Net, I believe, which I almost know nothing about, you know, or Visual C++, but higher language uh, uh, programming codes with uh, the computers we have nowadays work fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have a, another question, and uh, the question wants to know, um, uh, was there ever uh, a survey or some field work that you have or your company has done where things went uh, uh, wrong in ways that were not um, uh, expected. Wrong. Okay, that has many possible answers. <laughs> yeah. Wrong in a safety way. Yes, you know, like any company, we've had incidents. And we've had, luckily, never a major accident, but we've had a minor accidents. We've been running since 58 years, so yes, we've had some. Um, to correct that, you know, or to try to control it as maximum, we have a very, very tight uh, safety standards, you know, and uh, we try to improve them constantly, you know, so uh, it's very rare to have them, but uh, nevertheless, I ideally would like to have none, you know, so I point to that. Now, uh, on the quality of the geophysical survey, uh, yes, you know, there are surveys that we've gone and, uh, for instance, to do, and uh, we find electrical surveys where we find completely distorted uh, electrical signals and then I immediately, you know, when I see this, there haven't been many, but a few, I, the first thing I suspect is there's an interference from graphite or, or some other adverse element to our surveys and uh, I confirmed this with a company, uh, my client, and if that's the case, well, the survey cannot continue. You know, to me, if a survey is useful for a client, then it shouldn't be done, you know, so uh, like that, you know, I've had uh, some seismic surveys in areas where needed to be done, but the, the background level noise was so high, close to installations, and there was no way to stop it, you know, so uh, we had to cut areas or eliminate areas of survey. Um, magnetics, yes, I've had magnetic surveys. With, uh, actually, I've seen a couple of magnetic storms uh, running, you know, and how the magnetometers go absolutely berserk when that is happening. And the only thing you can do is sit down and wait. So the answer is yes. There's a few surveys that I've seen these kind of issues. Most of them, uh, geophysical issues, are either caused by geology or local environments that you cannot control. So uh, 
in the case of mag, well, you see it and wait until the magnetic storm passes. But in the case of graphite, for instance, for electrical methods or any kind of EM method, well, that's it for you. you know? So, uh, so yes, there are surveys that are difficult, and, and uh, but you have to stop them if you see the results are not proper. All right, thank you. Um, there's another question. What was the most challenging thing uh, you ever, uh, I guess you means you and or your company, ever encountered? It's pretty broad. Yeah, it's very broad. Uh, most challenging things. I don't know, you know. I like challenges. You know, and I like... Uh, easy routine type work is gets boring you know so i like challenges so i'm trying always to, to improve and, and i go back to it research and development to me is critical you know how can i improve what i'm doing is it's always in the back of my head uh, challenging could be morphologically challenging where it's been very difficult to run a survey due to topography for instance well in a area where there's the Andes, that's happened a few times, as you may imagine. Um, but um, I don't know, it's very broad, you know. Some surveys are more challenging than other ones, but I cannot pick one that I would say this was extremely challenging. Uh, I can only do that for surveys that during the field operation, they were extremely challenging uh, because of topography or issues with the communities or permits or things like that. Other than that, no, I tackled everyone the same way, tried to. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, where does your nickname Peppo come from? Okay. <laughs> I was just talking about this a few days ago. My nickname, yes, is Peppo. Everybody calls me like that. My name, Jose, I only use it for signing. Uh, it's my legal name at the end. But uh, it's very common in Spanish to call uh, people with the name Jose, to call them Pepe. And that comes from a very old tradition, because during the Mid Ages, the popes in the Vatican, every time they referred to St. Joseph, they signed with the initial PP, which meant Pater Paternalis, you know, our father at the end, you know. So, and, and so anyway, St. Joseph, Joseph was related to PP there. Nevertheless, uh, it didn't become very popular until uh, Napoleon's times. Napoleon had a brother whose name was Jose, who was an alcoholic. So uh, he was called, at some moment, somebody started calling him Pepe Botella, Pepe Bottle. And, uh, and the name Pepe started getting more and more common since. Now, why am I Pepe? Because my father is Pepe. So since I was very little and we both carry the same name, uh, I was called for as long as I remember, maybe even before I was born, I was called people. So that's where it comes from. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, there's uh, one more question. What do you feel would be, uh, will be the future for geophysicists? That is a very interesting question because this is a very exciting field. Geophysics, uh, I think, Instrument-wise, eh, there's always going to be improvements, you know. But to me, uh, geophysics has had some some moments in times where it's made some jumps in the different methods. It was a big jump for me when the MASW method appeared. You know, it was a, the first time—not only for me, for everybody—the first time that there was actually a decent way to measure S-wave velocity that didn't have to use a wooden plank on survey on surface, which was truly horrible. So we were able to improve signal quality. So it was a big jump there. Distributed systems, uh, to me, are a big improvement. It's a very large improvement, but it takes on a very large challenge, too, which is a huge data set just for a small survey, you know? So uh, and all the logistics that go with it are more complicated. So improving the quality of the methods, improving the quality of the signal analysis is going to be very important over the next few years. Is there going to be a new method that will come up? It's hard to say. They do every few years or so. Uh, you have to keep in touch. But I see geophysics still being 
as a field, a most uh, important uh, field to support oil and uh, mineral exploration. The reality is that prices vary, of course, everywhere, but we humans as a species are consuming, you know, materials, so there will always be need for more. Uh, so there's going to be always a future for geophysics, I believe. Okay. Uh, well, we're running out of time here, but we do have one more question. And the question asks, uh, when you're going to uh, begin a project, uh, do you choose the geophysical method for the objective of the study? Uh, or do you choose it for the geology in the area? Well, it's the two things. You know, the geology in the area is related to the kind of target you're going to study. There's cases when, even in cases where I'm asked to do a particular method with particular conditions, I always review it. You know, it's, it's good, it's, it's important to understand if what is being asked is going to work or not, or work in the best possible way is, is, is the thing, you know. So part of what I do always is, is talk about this beforehand. You know, we should do this method, or maybe we should modify the method you're thinking about to do this or that or maybe do an, an entirely different method. Uh, but yes, you know, there's no fixed recipe here. You have to look and ask about geology. Doing a blind method, like uh, being asked to do a, I don't know, they send you a certain amount of kilometers or this or that method and prepare a proposal. I always try to get uh, the information to, of what is the target to properly determine if that is appropriate. The thing is that nowadays, uh, many companies are being, uh, most of the decisions are being taken by by uh, cost control and people in the, in the purchasing departments, which have no idea about the technical part. So there is, a, I, I spend a lot of time usually explaining them why I'm uh, suggesting to do a change. You know, so uh, you're you're explaining people that are not geoscientists. So yes, it is important to, to suggest what is best according to the geology and the final target you're trying to study. All right. Well, we are out of time. So I'd like to thank you, Jose, for a very wonderful presentation and a great question and answer session. And thank uh, all of you for attending the SEG Latin America Regional Advisory Committee's webinar as part of our webinar series, A Path to a Career in Geophysics. Um, as Jose said, there is not one uh, path that's uh, for everybody. Every uh, survey and every geophysical path is different. So please. You know, just, uh, just to add to that, here. you just said, Laurie, for instance, I'll tell you, we were in Rolla, we were three geophysicists that graduated at the same time. One of them, Alex Martinez, very good friend of mine, of ours, you know, he's uh, right now one of the head researchers in Exxon. The other one is working in environmental geophysics in, in Illinois. And I'm working in mostly mining and geotechnical geophysics in Peru. So we all took different paths, you know, and, and you will be able to choose from what you enjoy the most. You know? So, yes, there's many applications. Well, I guess to that, I do have, I guess, a final question for you, Jose. I thought we were done and probably I could think of questions uh, all day. But um, you said at one point that you've attended the, the SEG annual meeting. Um, uh, every year since 2088 no, or eight, 1988 or something like that. So that's Most quite a long time. And I was yep. curious, as a near surface geophysicist and someone who's been involved in mining, um, uh, what I think is uh, the most uh, useful thing that you get from an SEG, which is typically mostly oil and gas? Well, the SEG has changed. Huh? When I started going, my father's been going since the late 60s, and I started going in the late 80s. And, uh, and there's been a big change. You know, first, in the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, it, there was a lot of mining component in it. But then, uh, when metal prices dropped in the early 70s, it went towards oil. And it's been mostly, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say entirely, but mostly an oil society until the 90s. The near surface community and the mining community in SEG started getting uh, more active since, you know. So what I get more of the SEG, oh, to me, uh, papers, looking at presentations, you know, see what where the research is going. 
uh, and seeing friends, of course, you know, which I think is one of the most enjoyable things. Hmm. Thank you. All right. Well, we definitely are out of time. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, Jose. Um, please look forward to uh, a follow-up email to uh, ask you uh, what you liked, what we could do better, and for you to submit um, suggestions for future webinar topics. And also, please look for our social media posts for next month's uh, interesting talk by George Buzan of CGG. So thank you again, and uh, please have a great day. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.